All right. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. All right. Uh, wishing you all a blessed and a fruitful 2024. I uh, trust you had a good time uh, during Christmas and New Year. So it's good to be back this year. <clears throat> and uh, this year, we will be going through discipleship and small groups, right? And we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of aspects when it comes to discipleship and small groups in context with the church and uh, uh, also outside of the church, right? So uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, there was some technical problems. I'm just using uh, a different laptop, but uh, I should be back on my laptop the next class onwards. Okay, shall we pray and just uh, submit this entire semester into God's hands and say, uh, let's pray that God will minister to us, speak to us uh, throughout the course of this semester, even as we learn that we will open our hearts, uh, we will receive uh, direction leading from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, I know this is the last semester for uh, all of us. Uh, it's wonderful to just be able to spend time together just studying and reading. So uh, I just request maybe any one of us to uh, please lead in prayer and just uh, surrender this entire semester under God's hand. Yes, anyone can pray, please. Anyone would like to pray? Yes, go ahead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the new semester that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness uh, throughout uh, the moment we chose this Bible college. We are here in the final semester, Jesus. We thank you, God, for leading us all through this way. It's your amazing grace, and we thank you for that. We thank you for Pastor Paul. We thank you for all the subject that he has taught us and the even the subject that he's about to teach us, we bless him in the name of Jesus. And I give all my classmates, uh, my dear friends, into your hands. I bless them all in the name of Jesus. But I just pray and I believe that the semester will be a, a semester of blessing to us where we will get the clarity of the calling. Uh, we will be equipped uh, uh, to just serve you, Lord, to just uh, humble ourselves, to just lift your name above all us, to reflect your glory wherever we go, Jesus. As we are listening to the lecture, God, you be with us. Uh, help us to open our mind and heart and just listen to and accept it and do it so that we can live this life for your glory. Help us to have a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. And we just give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jafina. All right, so uh, I have posted the notes on the stream, so I'm guessing that you have downloaded the same, and uh, feel free to just go ahead and uh, track along even as we uh, begin the course. Uh, okay, so just a few general information. Uh, if you look at your notes, we, we're going to be in this course, we're talking about three sections, right? Uh, section one is general information and guidelines, meaning uh, uh, when you when you talk about a church or when you talk about discipleship and uh, anything in in terms to do with the church guidelines are important right otherwise we'll go all over the place we may end up doing something we don't want to do and we may end up uh, wanting to do something which looks right but you know the outcome may be negative so general information and guidelines and the second session the second step is preparing to become a cell leader Right now, I know that many of us have, are already leading cell groups or probably you're already leading your own ministries and your own churches, uh, and that's wonderful. Uh, so you can, you've got your foundations, so it's, it's a good time to just uh, refresh ourselves and build on the foundation that we have already, uh, that you've already built. But for some of us, it may be, uh, you know, it's something that you're looking forward to, maybe to start your own church, your own cell group, own ministry. Uh, so how can we prepare to become a cell group leader, right? Uh, re the requirements, the hard preparation, uh, developing the skills that is required to be uh, a disciple and a leader. Uh, the third step 
is raising up disciples. And we talked a lot about uh, a few of these points uh, in the last semester in urban church planting. Uh, but we're going to go a little deeper in this course, we how to become a spiritual father, how to raise up leaders, reproduce leaders, and release them to do what you know whatever God has called them to do. Right. So this is what we're going to do throughout the uh, the course of this uh, semester. And uh, feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, you know, if you have any questions, any thoughts, feel free to uh, just uh, you know post a question on the chat, or you can just raise your hand, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions. Right. So let's go to uh, page five, which is understanding the vision for a cell church. Right? Uh, sorry, I need to keep looking at the other side because uh, I've got my notes open in my laptop. So uh, apologize if I'm just, you know, my, my view is going on both the sides, right? Uh, understanding the vision of a cell church. Now, when I say cell church, uh, there are two things that we must remember, right? Uh, now, one is you can have a church with a lot of cell groups, uh, you know, in, in APC, we call it live groups. Right? Uh, you can have a church with a lot of cell groups, or you can have a church, which is a cell group. And, and there's a big difference between these two. Right? Uh, and we look at a few of those differences, right? Many churches choose to transition from a program-based, event-based church to becoming a cell church. So. For example, you've got a church and they do a lot of events, do a lot of, you know, men's conference, women's conference, a lot of events within the church. But at one point of time, they may decide, okay, from this, from what we are doing, we're going to transition. We're going to move from just doing events, programs, and, uh, you know, Sunday services, all of that. But we will move and transition to become a cell church. Now, it can even work vice versa. You can have a cell church. Remember, we studied in urban church planting. You know, we start with maybe five, or you got your church planting team, and, and then you develop that and you uh, build a church. So you can have a cell church, which can later on transition to becoming a, a proper full-fledged church with all different kinds of ministries. Right, a church that has a cell that has cell groups will have cell groups plus a lot of events, but a cell group, a cell church, is basically focusing on you know uh, studying of God's word. It's it, the focus is only on that area, discipleship, raising up leaders, and uh, and so let's look at what is a cell. Right, uh, meaning what is a cell group? What is a cell church? And uh, uh, when we, when when I translate it to here, uh, I know many places in many countries as well. It's often referred to as cell church, but nowadays people call it life groups, uh, prayer groups. So it doesn't matter what we call it, uh, but the essence will show what the group is. Right. So, what is a cell group? Cell group is a small group of people uh, we have it on the notes there um, a small group of people not more than one leader with 12 members or, or a married couple uh, uh, with about six to seven other married couples meeting together for what here's here's the important part meeting together for building relationships edifying each other in the things of god and ministering together Right. So that is the foundation or the basis of a cell church, right? Uh, two, it is a microcosm of the kingdom of God. Now, we'll talk about how it is a biblical pattern, but when you look at the kingdom of God, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus, he, he, when he taught, he said the kingdom of God is uh, you know, like, a, like a mustard seed, or he says the kingdom of God is... Uh, like a man plowing the fields, he talks about it in a small, uh, with small examples. But there was a bigger picture, what Jesus was talking about. Now, in a cell church, 
when people look at a cell church right, uh, or a cell group, they may see just five or six people or 10 people in the group. But what's the bigger picture? Here's what you're doing. You're building relationships. You are edifying each other, which means you are edifying the church, fulfilling Ephesians. And you are ministering the things of God to each other. Right? It's a microcosm of the kingdom of God. It is a small unit of the local church. Right? That's what a, a, a cell group is. Right? Uh, look at the next point. It is not just a Bible study, or not just a prayer meeting, not just another service. It is a process of disciple making. Now, one of the things that we intentionally do in our life groups here in Bangalore is uh, we always leave it. We have a certain pattern and we'll look at the pattern later on in this uh, course, but we have certain pattern. There is a set pattern on how the cell group will work, right? First, you, you know, you, you may have worship. Then you have probably if it's a youth group, you have an icebreaker, you have a small game. Then we normally discuss what is happening, what is preached on a Sunday sermon, right? And we leave it open. Now, I always say this, uh, you know, on a Sunday morning, after church, we can go to the pastor and say, Pastor, I have two questions regarding your sermon. The pastor will say, please come back next week. Because it's, it's difficult. Right? We can't do that. Right? People are standing for prayer. Now, a cell group is the perfect place of, of you know, opening up to questions and thoughts. And it's a place where we build relationships. And so here in APC, what we do is uh, we have about 30 minutes of discussions. So it's not like, you know, it's not like uh, 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 somebody, the, the, the people come, sit in the cell group, and then one person keeps talking. You know? So one of the uh, you know, uh, guidelines that we give our life group leaders is talk less. Speak only when you're spoken to. Because it's very easy because as leaders, we're so used to talking. Sometimes it's you know it's good to even listen. Right? So we this this life group is a place where it's not just Bible study, it's not just a prayer meeting, but it is a process of disciple making. So for example, right uh, last Sunday we talked about take God at His word in ABC in, in church. Right. So what will happen in a life group is, or a cell group is, people will come, sit, and they introduce. You probably have the, you know, the worship and all of that. Uh, we begin with it, and then we open it up for discussion. So take God at His word. How can we take God at it? Probably there are three questions. We have that material also, meaning we have those questions which the life group leaders can use. So the, the questions are left open. Now, why is this important? Because we can have people in a cell group who are in different levels of maturity. There are some who can pray for one hour. There are some who can, who can pray for five minutes maximum. Right? But here is a place where they can ask questions. They can share their thoughts. They can reason. right? Uh, and, and, and so it is a process of disciple making. Now, when you look at Jesus, when you look at Jesus, when he chose his 12, what did Jesus do? He spent time with them. Very importantly, he spent time with those 12, with the disciples. He took them along. He showed them. He made them see his life. And so when, when we talk about discipleship, we'll later on in the course, we'll talk about attributes and characteristics of disciple making and all of that. Uh, but when we talk about disciple making, it is, it is the most, one of the most important aspects. Uh, you know, the Lord Jesus said, 
go and make disciples. The last thing he said was that. So it is critical, it is very important. And the whole cell group or the life group model is a beautiful way of raising up disciples. Right? In every cell group, people can be evangelized, they can receive prayer, there's healing, there's deliverance, there's fellowship, there's Bible teaching, there's edification, visitation, follow up, discipleship, uh, there's unity, there's oneness. Right? Now, one of the important aspects that we must understand is never look at a cell group and say, hey, this is only 10 people. Because, you know, we may think, oh, church is church, right? Church is always church. Uh, uh, and I can get healed only when I'm in church. Or God can speak to me only when I'm in church. Or, you know, God can uh, only uh, minister to me through the word only when I'm in church. And I'm sure that all of us have passed through those uh, seasons and now we have come out of it. We know that God can minister to us at, at, through anyone at any time. But a cell group, in a cell group, we must be open for healing, for deliverance, for the working of the Holy Spirit, for um, signs, wonders and miracles. We must be open to all of that. We must be open for the, uh, you know, when we are praying for God to answer prayers, for, for everything that we ex expect. When we go to a Sunday service, we must have the same expectancy when we come to a cell group. And how is this expectancy created? As leaders, uh, we'll have to you know, uh, build that expectancy. We'll have to pray. We'll have to uh, be able to uh, communicate things correctly. And uh, uh, we will learn about that as well. right? Anything needed in the body of Christ ought to be found in a cell group. Right? So we look at it, we don't separate. We, we don't separate church. Okay, this is church, this is cell group. Now, in a sense, you can have a cell church, which is only meeting different places, studying God's word, reading God's word. Uh, discipleship, that's the main focus. And you can have a church that is that is doing maybe 10 events every month and they have life groups or cell groups. Both are important and both are, uh, you know, in, in both the cell groups, God will work. So our responsibility is to never differentiate them. In a sense, they may be different, but God can God works through both of them. And both aspects uh, involve disciple making. And I hope you're, you're understanding what I'm trying to uh, explain here. Right? So you can have a small cell group, you can have a church with 1,000 people. In both places, be expectant. Because God can work through that. Right? Okay, let's look at the next one. The cell group or the small groups and disciples small groups, discipleship is later on, but uh, the small groups, when we look at it, we see that it is not something that, you know, we made up or the church made up in the early first century. No, it is a biblical pattern which started all the way, even from the time of Jesus. Right? Now, let's look at this. In the New Testament, we see a lot of small groups happening in house meetings. Jesus did a substantial amount of his teaching and miracles in people's homes and group settings. Right? So if you remember, uh, if you read the book of Acts, uh, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul's first missionary journey, we see that most eight out of ten places that Apostle Paul went were in small group home settings. Interestingly, the church in Rome, the, the Roman church, right, if you see in the book of uh, Romans, he, towards the end he says, uh, you know, greet those who meet in the household. Right? In the house, the, 
the Apostle Paul was also under house arrest, but he had people coming in and uh, visiting him for over the last, over those three and you know, three years or so. The early believers conducted a lot of their ministry in small group settings. Now, why is this important to know? Or why must we understand this? Because what they did in the New Testament church, we see the ripple effect over the years that even now, what five or six people or 10 people were doing in a small room thousands of years back. Now, even now, we talk about it. And even now, we are following that model. So what does it teach us? That this model is tried, it has been tried, and it's successful. Right? And we, we will also talk about a few limitations. You know, some, some of you may ask me, but that is, you know, 2000 odd years before. Now we are busy. We have hundreds of things to do. Nobody has time to come and sit for life group. That's true. We all are busy. We live in a busy world. Uh, but our busyness doesn't change the fact that a prayer group or a cell group is, is something that God really desires. And God can really work through that. Let's look at a few verses in the book of Acts. Right, Acts 2.46. Uh, this is after the church, after uh, the Apostle Peter has preached out his heart and uh, thousands of people have come to believe in Jesus. And look at this, what happens? Acts 2, 46. And they continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Breaking bread from house to house, a perfect representation of cell groups. Look at Acts 5.42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Right? Acts, 8, Acts 20. Acts 20, Paul is... No, I think Paul is in Ephesus, if I'm not wrong. He's in Ephesus. And uh, and when they were, they were coming to him, he said unto them, Yes, ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me. Verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Look at what Apostle Paul is saying now. Uh, I think, I think I'm a hundred percent sure he's in Ephesus for the next 20 years around there. He's talking to the believers and he's saying, I have not kept anything for me. I've not done anything for my own regard, but I have, um, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. So we see the Apostle Paul, he, he did both. Right? There was this public preaching and ministry. It's also the house to house. Right? Acts 28, 30 and 31. Now, would anyone like to read this? Acts 28, Acts chapter 28, 30 and 31. Go ahead. Anyone can please read. Acts 28, verse 30 and 31. Sorry, I can't, uh, you know, uh, present the notes here, but I think next class we, I'll be able to do that. So if you don't mind, you can just uh, open up your notes and you can read it. It's on page 6, Acts 28, 30 and 31. Go ahead. Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Hmm. Thank you, Vivian. So 
we see that and and Paul dwelt two years in his own hired house. And what was he doing there? Preaching and teaching. People came to him, and he was able to, you know, uh, minister to them. Acts sixteen and verse five. Yes, anyone would like to read that, please? And maybe you know, we can just read all those verses just for us to get a context. Let's go ahead. Romans sixteen five. It's in your notes. Romans chapter sixteen, verse five. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved Ephesus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Yes, thank you. So you see, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. First right? Corinthians 16, 15. I beseech you, brethren, that ye know the house or family of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. First Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Right. Uh, let's go to Philemon 1 and verse 2. It says, And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So, so we see that all through uh, the, the, the New Testament, all through during the early church, this was something that was common. And, and when we continue to read, uh, especially after the Roman persecution, and again, the Jews themselves began to persecute uh, Christians. And the Roman persecution was very, very intense. Uh, so there came a time when there was no public churches. Right? Uh, uh, there came a time that it was only small groups. Right? Uh, remember Nero? Right? He, he made a decision. He said, I'm going to wipe out this religion of Christianity. We read of the atrocities that he committed when uh, he was emperor. It's just heart-wrenching. Uh, Christians were burned as torches. Christians were thrown to the lions. Uh, and they were tortured. They were martyred. Yet, people met in small groups. What, you know, what these uh, emperors and People tried to wipe out the religion of Christianity. It's some, you know, God sustained it through cell groups. Such a powerful rule. You know, if you think of it, there was no big churches. There was no way that pe people could, you know, thousands of people could come and sit and one man is preaching and everyone are listening. No. If you look at the uh, early century, the first and the second century church, it was the most it was the bloodiest century the second and the third century for christians yet god in his wisdom was able to use the cell group model or the life group model people sit meeting in houses and sustained the ministry sustained what he wanted to do and so we see that through all of this work we have read that it is a biblical model. Cell groups, cell churches are biblical. It's not something wrong, nor is it, some, no, you know, maybe some of us are planning to start a church in your home. There is nothing wrong. Right? Uh, you may not have an LED screen and a big band, that's okay. There's nothing wrong to start small. Right? We can we can start. No worries. It's it's you you are following the word of God. Right. The cell church movement emphasizes that the cell is not just as important as a Sunday celebration, and that both of them are equally emphasized. The early church, if you look at it, uh, you know uh, they met in larger gatherings, but they also made sure that they met in smaller settings and from house to house. Right. So. Why cell groups? Why cells? And, uh, why not just have Sunday church services? Right? Uh, 
why do we need to have this cell group? Why not just have cell church? Oh, sorry, why not have just church services and all these other events, conferences, and uh, you know, uh, what we do every year? Why not that way? So let's look at a few uh, important pointers on why cell groups are important. Everyone with me? I, okay. Why cell groups or cell churches or whatever it may be, uh, why is it important? Uh, why is it that what happened in the early church, the, the meeting of house to house, why do we have it now? Right? Uh, let me let me just share this. You know, at, at APC, I joined APC as a life group coordinator. Right? And one of the things that I noticed, it's very prominent, we can, we can just see it, is that when life people who meet in life groups, after a couple of months or maybe a year, you will see them, they are so, it doesn't matter, you know, they're so attached to each other. There's this feeling of oneness, there's a feeling of family. Right? Uh, they meet, they, they're able to spend time together, they're able to, uh, you know, just this feeling of oneness. Uh, and they're willing to, uh, you know, be there for each other. I know of a, of a couple of life groups here where they travel 15 kilometers to go to the life. I thought to myself, wow, 15 kilometers, one side of Bangalore to the other side. Why? Because we used to live there and we were part of that life group and, I, and they built community, they built relationships and they just, uh, you know, they just know each other. So no, we'll go. It's okay. The ones that do these they go. So you see, cell groups does all of this. Right? Okay, so let's look at the first one. Why cell groups? It provides the most efficient means of pastoring and evangelism. Here, I like the word pastoring here. To pastor means to shepherd. Right? The cell church is the most efficient means of reaching unbelievers and pastoring believers. That means you shepherd the believers. Uh, it's an opportunity to provide personal ministry to all believers. Now, uh, picture this. Right. Uh, say you you are um, you are you have a church which about with about two hundred people, and you have maybe five life groups or cell groups, and you have a young man who's joined the church, and he says, you know what, uh, I want to be part of a smaller group just to get to know people. And this young boy, maybe in his early twenties, I'm just giving you an example, right? early 20s he comes into this life group and in the life group they're teaching maybe you know the book of uh, Daniel for example and there's something that grips his heart he says wow I want to be like Daniel and so here in this life group you as a leader you you can pastor or 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 you know minister to this young boy and he is able to ask questions he is able to speak he is able to uh, you know uh, share his thoughts everything he is able to do because there is personal ministry happening now we do understand that we are all in a busy world and we may not have time continually but remember Remember the point that we read? It's a microcosm of the kingdom of God, meaning that one person can be the next Daniel for the kingdom of God. Right? It's a, it's a very efficient means of pastoring and evangelism. Again, you can invite people, say, hey, why don't you come? Usually, when you invite people to uh, you know, a smaller setting, a smaller home, uh, they agree. Well, right? Not that even church they do agree, but when you say hey, we're having a small get together, why don't you come? Normally they do agree, and it becomes a a, a means of evangelism, right? So uh, most importantly, it, it 
it, it's like pastoring one on one. You're building this person up, one person, or maybe two people. It's one on one. So you look at this person, and he's in his twenties. He has no clue what, or any, about the Bible. He doesn't know anything. But you're sowing into this person. You're sacrificing. You're pastoring him, and then. When he's 30 or 32 years old, 10 years later, you look at this, he's become a man. He's no more a young boy, not knowing anything or just weak, but now he's strong in the world. What have you done? You have pastored this person. You have raised up a disciple for the kingdom of God. That's what you've done. Now, and people may not appreciate it, People may not clap for you and say, okay, wonderful job you have done. Nobody will do all of that. But in God's eyes, you, are, you have done discipleship. You have raised up a leader. You have raised up a disciple for God. And it's big. It's a big thing in God's eyes. Right? Second point, <clears throat> recapturing families. When Again, as I said, you know, when, when you meet in cell groups, families get together. Or even if it's youth groups, get together. Right? They move out from this receiving mode and get into the giving mode. We come, we sit in church, and we listen. And then we wish everyone and go back home. That's called receiving mode. But in a cell group, you get into the giving mode. So you can have two, three, or maybe three families, you're there, say, hey, you know what, God spoke to me this way. And I, I just feel that God is doing this in my life. And I want to pray that God can do it in your life as well. What is happening? You're going into the giving mode, right? The families are getting united, right? They, when they begin to use their homes to host the cell groups, they bring ministry activity right into the heart of their lives and are actually touching lives around them. When you, uh, you know, you, you, when you are going into homes, you're, you're inviting the presence of God. You're inviting the power of God to touch their lives. Right? And, and uh, it says here, there's a quote here, we used to go to church to get God and bring him home. Now we get God at home and bring him to the church. What a wonderful quote. And, you know, we used to go to church to get more of God and bring him home. But now with the cell group model, we get more of God here at home as well and then bring him to church. That's a wonderful way of you know, going into this from this receiving mode to the giving mode. I'm not saying the receiving mode is not important, very important. We all must uh, be able to receive even you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line as ministers, we must be able to receive. But uh, we can't only be receiving. We also need to step out and give and minister to others. And here uh, in the cell group, there's no titles, there's no uh, you know, certificates that are required. There's no class. There's no, uh, you know, status, nothing. All of them are one, building each other up. So, so we'll, we, what we'll do is we'll stop here with these two points. We'll get into point three from on Friday, next class. Uh, get to point three, and uh, we'll continue to learn from this. Right. Shall we just uh, close in prayer? Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for enabling us to just touch on the topic of cell groups. Lord, we pray that even as we continue to learn, that you will teach us, you will minister, and our hearts will be ready to receive from you, Lord. We thank you, God. We, we just submit this entire week into your hands. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. God bless you all. I'll see you on Friday. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much, Pastor. God bless you.